I'm back. I meant to take about three to six weeks off, and now it's been six months. I thought I was sidelined by life because my life is constantly crazy. It's constantly challenging me. It's constantly irritating. It's constantly exciting. So much has happened. And I have produced about a gazillion episodes in my head and have not gotten anything actually done. And then all of a sudden, in the last few weeks, I realized I'm not being sidelined by life. My life has always gone on. It's always been an exaggerated version of most people's lives. It's always been exciting. There's always been too much to typically handle for one person. But that's not my problem. My problem is I'm full of excuses. I have come up with an excuse every day for about, well, I think I am almost exactly on six months from when I took my little hiatus, what was supposed to be a very short break, to turn 50, celebrate myself, and then get back into it. But I've just come up with excuse after excuse after excuse as to why I can't get things done today. And I keep putting it off saying, I'll do it tomorrow. And I received a call from a very, very, very close dear friend of mine from Colorado. Her son called and let me know that she is dying of ALS. And wow, nothing will put things into perspective and remind you that tomorrow may actually never come like a phone call like that. I'm Nikki Lynn Chase, and this is my podcast, Adult Chicken. It's about navigating life's unexpected. These are my stories. This is my adventure going through life as a single mom to two special needs kids. In addition to making excuses, I'm a master at procrastinating. And I'm really good at avoiding things. I'm really good at if I've got things to do, if I need to produce a podcast, I'm really good about instead of working on it, I'll work on it in my head, just stress myself out. And then I'll walk a few circles in the house. Maybe I'll go and wipe a, we don't have a dishwasher, so I'll wipe a spoon off and then I'll go fold a shirt and then I'll walk around the house a few more times and then I'll rally the kids up and say, let's go to the skate park. Sometimes we'll do that two or three times a day. We'll just go skateboarding to avoid everything that needs to be done. And then I'll make excuses and then I'll tell myself I'll do it tomorrow and things do not get done. The one thing I'm good about, though, is wishing people happy birthday. If I know it's your birthday, and I'm not great about knowing anybody or remembering anybody's birthday, but if social media reminds me it's somebody's birthday, I will reach out. And I'm not great about staying in touch, but there are a few select people I am adamantly on top of reaching out to. One in particular is one of my favorite people that I spent the majority of my time with the latter years I was in in Colorado. We worked together for 13 years and she was just my favorite. She was my favorite person in in the mountains. And we don't catch up a lot, but when we do, it's one of those friends where no time has passed and we laugh and bright as light in all avail. And It was her birthday and I reached out. I sent her a text message and told her she needed to get a hold of me. Like we needed to catch up. We had a lot to catch up on and it didn't go through. I could see that the text message didn't go through and I sent her son a message via social media because it did concern me. We were always good about not constantly talking, but always getting back to each other when the other one would would call or text. And I think it was maybe day after I was on the phone. It was the evening and I was on the phone with a friend of mine and a Vail, Colorado number rang my phone. And I mentioned it. I said, oh God, that's a Vail number. And my buddy said, answer it. And I said, I can't, I can't answer it. That's Vail. <laughs> that's PTSD right there. That just gave me a zinger of a feeling that I can't answer that. No good news comes from my past life in Vail. I loved my life. I didn't know how fucked up my life was because I didn't know any different. Now I know how fucked up it was and I don't talk to very many people from that part of my life and I avoided the phone. I didn't answer it. And then the next day, 
I had procrastinated enough on my workout, so I was finally at the gym again, and that phone number called my phone again. It was my friend's son. And I knew as soon as he said who he was, I was going to hear something I absolutely didn't want to hear. And he had asked if I knew she was sick, and I said I didn't know. And when her son let me know that she was sick, let me know that she was dying of ALS and gave me all of the information, he had let me know that she was in Las Vegas, not in Colorado anymore. And I immediately thought about the last time we spoke and that I had told her she was engaged to be married. And I said, you cannot get remarried and you cannot die in Colorado because I'm not coming back to Colorado for, I don't think anything. And I couldn't quite figure out how I missed her being sick. She would never allude to the fact that she was sick or didn't feel well. I knew that about her. She's a very, very, very stubborn person (laughs) and tough. One of the toughest people I have ever known and absolutely the brightest light. So she was very positive and she was really happy. And we had a normal, typical, awesome conversation the last time we spoke. I did notice she was slurring her words. I thought she was enjoying retirement. I thought she was enjoying a glass or several glasses of wine just in the middle of the day, which wouldn't have been too weird. It's what we did. It's what we did in the mountains. That's what we did. We partied together. We enjoyed wine and a lot of it. And we enjoyed dancing. She was my dance buddy. I remember moving to Vail, Colorado. And when I first got my job, she was the person I just clicked with. She was instantly one of my very best friends in my whole entire life and we just clicked and we had so much in common and she was just always the brightest light at work it could be the worst day in the whole wide world you'd see her face and she always lit up a room she had an infectious smile she was always fun and she was drop dead gorgeous she just had this natural beauty that didn't quit. And I thought of all of our times together, all of our dancing, all of our going out. There weren't pole dancing establishments in Vail, and neither one of us were good at pole dancing. But we had this (laughs) strange desire to exhibit our lack of pole dancing skills every time we went out. And so we would go around to each and every bar drinking establishment, watering hole, whatever you want to call it. And we would find something that would act as a pole and we would pole dance together. And we were fully grown adults. I just didn't act like it. I started digging up pictures as quickly as I could. I also told her son I would be there as soon as I possibly could. I would let him know within a couple of days when I was going to be throwing the kids in the car and heading to Vegas. And I thought about what it would be like to see her. He explained how difficult it is to see her now and that this would really be more for me than it would be for her because she's really at the tail end of life. She's not going to live much longer. And death is a weird thing, I think, for any and everybody to process. Unlike some people I know who seem very comfortable with death, and I always think they're just saying that, maybe they are comfortable with death. Maybe they're at peace with what happens if and when you die. I I am not. I am not probably mostly because I am the sole and only provider, the only person my children have. And I can't imagine what happens if I do in fact die. But I don't like thinking about it. But I think about it all the time. I hate thinking about it. But when I found out what she had and that it's ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and that her whole entire body was shutting down. And I think about the light, the energy, the everything that she embodies and thinking she's probably one of the smartest people I've ever known in my entire life. But that woman is brilliant. And I thought to be in a position where you can't make words, you can't move your body, you can't request that you want something as simple as a sip of water but your mind is intact. It killed me. It broke my heart. I I couldn't imagine and I can't imagine a worse way of dying. And I also knew I needed to get to Las Vegas as quickly as I possibly could. So I found out the news on Thursday. I had the kids packed and ready to go on Sunday. 
And I was bringing the party to her. She had honored my wishes, which were do not get remarried and do not die in Colorado because I'm not coming back there to see you. But she was in Vegas and I told the kids it was a practice trip. Bootsy turns 21 this year and we've been discussing going to Vegas. So this was an impromptu practice trip to Vegas and we packed up the car and off we went. Of course, my kids being my kids, they were thrilled to death. They knew I was sad. They knew I was really sad. And the two of them trying to process whatever it is I might be going through, that's always interesting because they don't know quite what to do with my emotions. My emotions are usually uh, either I'm irritated and raging mommy going nuts at whatever it is they're doing that's driving me nuts or I am fun we're rocking out having the time of our lives hitting every skate park that we can find and going 980 miles per hour sadness is not something they see very often hardly ever actually and I was sad I am sad so we get in the car and off to Vegas we go. And it was such an interesting contrast because my kids could not contain their enthusiasm. Neither one have ever been to Vegas. Bootsy went when she was a little baby, but there's no recollection. I hadn't been and hadn't wanted to actually ever return. (laughs) Hadn't been since I turned 40, but it was something I can't say I was excited about, but it needed to happen. I needed to let my friend know that she was still one of the most important people to date that's ever been part of my life. So we hit Prim, Nevada, and they see their first casino, and it's got a ginormous roller coaster around it. And they lose their minds. They absolutely lose their minds. They're, oh my God, oh my God, can we stop? I'm like, we're not going to stop at every one. Just keep your eyes open. And we get to our hotel. <laughs> and we stayed, we weren't staying on the strip, we we're staying just outside. And Imagine two kids who they get excited about anything and everything. They think everything is freaking amazing. It's everything is off the chain, just wowzers. And that could be an adventure to the grocery store. They think everything's freaking awesome. So we get to the hotel and they walk in. And of course, it's a casino. (laughs) And they are awesome over the moon flipped the fuck out they cannot believe what they're seeing there are lights i was disappointed because slot machines are not dinging like they used to ding i forgot you can smoke inside in las vegas so that smell all of it kind of brought me back to oh god it's vegas but they were blown away the hotel we stayed at had like a little It almost looked a bit like a town is set up. So they've got the different places to eat. I think there's a Baskin Robbins, a little hot dog place, Starbucks. They think that's the most amazing thing. All of those, like a food court, but it looks like a little town. Blown away. Then they discover there's an arcade and it's all over. (laughs) It's like I walked them into the most magical place in the world. And I thought this will be interesting. So after, I can't say my kids came down from their casino high. They were just on top of the world. And uh, her son came to meet me after work. And we sat and we talked for a couple of hours. We talked about her. We reminisced. I had this memory. My most vivid memory of him was when he was turning, he was 12, turning 13, and he had, he had lost, he was the kid that always lost everything. He was the kid that was, he's always in trouble for something, and he always lost everything, and he'd lost his probably umpteenth millionth ski jacket, and I remember he just didn't care, and they, his parents, made him wear a jacket from years ago, (laughs) and he didn't care. The jacket, the jacket was like a three-quarter sleeves jacket on him and I just remember he was the happiest birthday boy ever and that was my memory of him and here comes this full-grown adult man and I couldn't believe it he 
walked in and the first thing I noticed was his jacket. The sleeves didn't go all the way down. And I said, well, come on, man, we can't get this together this many years later, this many years later. So we sat and talked and we talked about his mom. We talked about his dad. We talked about his family. We talked about everything. He had more or less all the same memories I had, only he was a kid. He just remembers us being at his house where all the dance parties happened. He remembered so many things. He remembered all the people that she and I worked with and all the people that we had in common. And we made plans for how the next day would go, which was the day I would get to see her. And there, there's no preparing somebody for that, but I have been around a lot of sickness. I tried to prepare myself and I just wanted to make it as happy and good for her as I possibly could. So the next morning, he, her son showed up to pick me up and took me to the home where she resides. And essentially she's starving to death. She had been able to articulate in a and had everybody agreed not to be kept alive on a feeding tube and also not no oxygen. So at this point, she's in the stage of she's essentially starving to death. I walked in and there she was in the bed and it was, um, it was still my buddy. It was my, it was my buddy. And a friend of mine had mentioned playing music for her. It had reminded me how therapeutic music is and can be, especially for somebody who is dying. And the one thing my Clark face loved, I think she saw every show she could possibly attend and go to every concert, uh, the Rolling Stones. And I had also just watched the Bee Gees documentary and I'd chosen a few songs from, from that and I brought my earbuds and I brought her a bottle of wine. I might have taken the glasses. I was a little worried about wine glasses and I didn't end up pouring the wine in the glasses, but I brought up a couple of glasses from the hotel and I put the music in, I brought the pictures. I brought a few pictures of us and I, I showed her. And I put the music in her ears and I held her hands and I said, hey, Clark Face, what are you doing? You're supposed to be at the club last night. You didn't show up at the club. You think you're coming to Vegas and we're not going to do our dancing? You're crazy. And she knew I was there. I joked with her. I brought her the sounds she loved. And I did talk some shit about some of the people that we worked with that we used to talk a lot of shit about. And that, that was fun. I enjoyed that. I hope she enjoyed it too. But seeing her like that reminded me I've been given a lot of perspective in my lifetime. There was a lot, I, I don't think I even knew or understood what perspective was until I spent as much time as I did with my son Sandler in the hospital and going down to the hospital. When I say going down, I was going from the mountains to Denver to go to Children's Hospital. And the amount of perspective I gained with those trips to a hospital full of children, many, obviously sick, many dying, and my own son, who I was told was not going to live, and getting to see him live life and doing it, I think, to our fullest, is having been given the gift of perspective. Seeing her like that, uh, gosh, gives you so much perspective to take every minute of your life where you're able-bodied, where your body works. This poor woman is a prisoner in her own body. And I want to make sure after seeing her like that, I try my hardest not to take a minute for granted. I also want to make sure uh, I get my shit together and something as simple as having a playlist, God forbid something like this happens to me, I would want to have some things in line. It makes you think about, holy crap, you need to get your shit together. I want a playlist. If I should end up with something debilitating like this, 
I want the music or the sounds pumping in my ear. If that if if I can't express or tell somebody what I want, it needs to be written down. It just gave me so much to think about, but it also did give me so much perspective. After seeing her, the kids knew that it was time for them to enjoy Vegas. And I told them I would take them to the strip. (laughs) And again, once, once again, the contrast of what I'm there doing, and then back into mom mode of taking kids who are so overstimulated and excited to the strip. It was death and then it was life. <laughs> it was, yeah, it sounds very dramatic, but that's what it was. I saw my friend dying and I'm with two kids that just embody life and think everything's just awesome. And so after seeing her and it having our experience, having our last dance, I had to sit with my heart and my head for a minute, a lot of minutes. And I also had to gear up to be back on as mom with my two kids who couldn't wait to see the rest of Las Vegas. And it was a very interesting, difficult contrast of death and life because here I have just seen one of my favorite people probably not going to make it much longer starving to death and a prisoner in her own body yet minutes later here are my kids who live every moment in the moment carpe diem to the max and can't get enough of life and I was eternally grateful I am eternally grateful I think it helped remind me to be less annoyed with them less short fused because seeing Vegas through their eyes was freaking amazing. (laughs) So we headed to the strip and we had plans to meet up with her son again. And let me just explain what an amazing person he is because there are three kids and I love all the kids. He was the one I was closest to because he was the youngest and he was just He was always around and he was just always happy. And then to see him a man, having become a man, he's got his own child. He's a very well-respected chef in Las Vegas and he's got his life together and he's taken on his mom, his dying mother. And the best thing that I got to witness and experience was that she has spent the last couple of years in this deteriorating state with her son who's taken care of her and really taken the bull by the horns, stepped it up and has done something most people I honestly don't think can do. And she got to see him. She got to meet her grandchild. She got to see this kid become this incredible man. And that to me was the greatest gift I got out of being in Vegas was seeing that She, knowing that she got to witness that and and experience him as he has become. And the night, Monday night was the big night on the strip. So I drive to the strip. That was the other thing I thought I'd never driven around Las Vegas. I was always drunk because I drive to Vegas typically from Colorado or fly in there, but I didn't drive around. We just, I'd stay on the strip and I'd only go wherever I could either take a taxi, party bus, limo. <laughs> I was not a high roller, but those things kind of come come with Vegas territory. And I'd never driven in. So here I am with the kids. We're driving to the strip. I waited till it got dark so they could see the lights. And they were just in awe. Once again, the jaws were on the floor. And we get to the strip. The first thing Sandler sees are two women and he said they forgot their pants and I look over and it's two women that have thongs on with handcuffs attached to their thongs and they're passing out whatever it is they're passing out and come see us at this club or whatever it was and he takes his phone out and he takes a picture and I'm like that is such perfect Vegas and I knew and of course there wasn't a second that was going by where I wasn't thinking about my friend in our last dance but I thought 
this is, I think, being orchestrated by her. She would want to see this whole event. She thought the same things were funny. There was no way she wasn't thinking that would be hilarious watching Sandler see these two half-naked women, uh, three-quarters naked women, passing out things and him pulling his camera out to take a picture. Went to the hotel and met up with her son. And he walked us through his kitchen and he was such a big deal. It was so, so amazing to see. We'd go through security there with me. It was so impressive. He was so grown up. He was so well respected. It was so impressive. Before moving on to special edition and introducing my host, Sandler Chase, also my son, I need to report that the person who this whole episode is about, my very dear and close friend, Katie Clark, also known as Clarkface, or at least known to me as Clarkface, passed away. While recording this episode, I received a phone call from her son, and he let me know and informed me that she had passed away. It was very, 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 very sad. Obviously, anytime anybody passes away, it's extremely sad. I don't think there are words to express how difficult it is or what it's like to process somebody's death who was suffering. Katie lived an incredibly full life. She was the light. I mentioned that probably a gazillion different times while talking about her in this episode. She walked into a room and lit that room up as the brightest light probably in the whole town of Vail, Colorado. She was beautiful inside and out. She was the person that didn't age. And of course, when I saw her and she had been suffering from ALS and deteriorating quickly from what I understood from what her son had said, uh, because she didn't want anybody to know and she didn't want anybody to remember her as she was leaving the world. She wanted everybody to remember her as she was when she was in Colorado, when she was living her best life. When we went skateboarding the evening, I had found out that Clark Face had passed away. I was so relieved that she was done suffering, but so very, very sad. And I knew and know that processing her death is, is going to be difficult. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a lot of first being grateful that I got to see her that I got to see her right before she passed away, just a week before, well, I guess less than a week before. And I got to have my last dance. I got to tell her I loved her. I got to hold her hands. I got to show her pictures. I got to reminisce. And even though physically she couldn't respond or really do much, I knew she knew I was there. And she did try to muster a couple of smiles. I knew from her son that that was the most responsive she'd been in, in quite some time. I got to see her and I got to tell her I loved her. And that was remarkable. That was incredible. But when we were coming home from skateboarding's my therapy. It's where I go to process everything and everything. It's where I go to take out a bad day. It's where I go to shut my brain off the best I can. My brain never shuts off. I've got this nasty little brain I live with and it's mean and it's and it's always working overtime and it's always just going. But when I skateboard, I have to focus so hard on whatever it is I'm doing on a skateboard to reduce risk or to do whatever it is I'm doing. It. I've mentioned this many a times. It's the closest to a meditative state I have ever gotten myself into. Too much of a spaz to do anything like yoga. So that's where I find my peace. It's also where my kids aren't four centimeters from my personal space. <laughs> so it's very helpful in that regard. But after skateboarding and after having a very long day of thinking about my dear friend, Katie, or Clark Face, as I called her, we were in the car and Bootsy, my daughter, handles things in a way where she kind of knows when to just be quiet. She just knows when to not say anything. And Sandler works in a very opposite, on, uh, on a very opposite end of it, on that spectrum of, he's always asking questions. I mean, the questions are always coming, no matter what, whether we're in a good mood, bad mood, whatever kind of mood I'm in, the questions are coming. And as much as I try to preserve their innocence and I try to preserve them thinking 
every minute is just glorious and wonderful. There are minutes that aren't awesome. There are days that are not great. There are freaking times I want to tell them to shut the fuck up and stop asking me stupid fucking questions because I am sad or I am angry or I am frustrated and I don't have the patience to answer questions like, are we going back to Vegas? Yet I can appreciate the fact that that's what they got out of our time when I went to go see my sick friend. I guess I'm very lucky in that my kids, there was no sadness. There was just a, that was the best trip of my life. And without further ado, here is the host of Special Edition. My name's Tina Cheese, and I'm the host of Special Edition. And we we going to talk about, about Las Vegas, what it will, what it look like. Oh yeah, did you enjoy Las Vegas? Yes, what? it was really crazy. <laughs> it is pretty crazy, isn't it? Yes. And you, and, kn- you know we went there for a not so awesome reason. Uh-huh. So it was quite an adventure, wasn't it? Our, yes. Our trip to Las Vegas. It was really wild. So we just, we didn't know we were going. No. And all of a sudden we just kind of packed up and decided we better hurry up and. She go by to Katie, Katie Face. Uh-huh. Clark Face is Clark what I called Face. her. But tell everybody about your experience to Las Vegas. You will get bored at um, Las Vegas. You no, know, you don't. It's kind of hard to get bored in Las Vegas. Yeah. That's for sure. I agree with you. So, what you experience? Of a I've Las- had a lot of Las Vegas experiences, and I just talked about this particular one where I was there for a very different reason than any other trip to Las Vegas, mm-hmm. and it was to have my last dance with my buddy. And even I'm, though it was really sad, mm-hmm, but we still have a lot of fun. So when we get there, you just just seen a lot of tall buildings and. Lots of lights. Lots of lights in Vegas. So many lights, you can't count. No, you cannot. It would be very hard (laughs) to count the lights in Vegas. So, when I got there, it was just alright. But when I got in the hotel, I was just mindful because I just never been there. And it's so exciting. It is an exciting place. Uh Uh-huh. What was your, what was the most exciting thing about being in Las Vegas for the first time? The arcade and the strip mall. The strip mall or the strip? Strip. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, gosh. There's another one in there, but I'll, I'll save that. Okay, what did you think of the strip? That's right, because we, we went the second night we were there. Uh-huh. We were there for two nights, which uh-huh. seems, was that plenty of time to be there? Yeah. Would you have liked to have stayed more? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So, what, what did you think about the strip? It was... Very exciting. What was lot- the first thing? Do you remember the first thing you saw on the strip oh, that yeah. you pointed out? Um, <laughs> the lady got no pit. I, I saw a lady without. She, she really didn't have that much clothes, and she really um handcuffed on her whole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she forgot her pants. Yeah, she, she forgot. So her she had, but she had her handcuffs. Yeah, cuffed to her. Uh-huh. Uh her uh <laughs> bridges. Oh, bridges. so when we got done going to las vegas las vegas we went to um the donut shop no the, um, oh the donut shop where bootsy insisted on getting a sweatshirt <laughs> and that sweatshirt mm-hmm. very bright pink yeah but and you do you know miss- what it says pink box donuts no, and pink, then on the no. back it says so good you'll want to lick the box yeah. Do you know and what that she, means? What? That donuts are delicious? Yeah. Yes. And we saw a, um, sh- what do you call we, we, um, Oh, at the rest stop. Yeah. We saw a couple people heading to a uh, prison. Yeah, prison or jail. But I'm pretty sure it was prison because they were shackled. Shackled and... And they were going to be in the van that had the cage. Yeah. Or like it, the, it was something else. It was something else. That was quite an experience. <laughs> so... After exciting. experiencing Vegas mm-hmm. and all the excitement mm-hmm. Vegas has to offer, the ladies that forgot their pants on mm-hmm. the strip, uh-huh. the strip with all the lights, yeah. the people that were shackled at the rest stop, mm-hmm. the numerous places to eat, the arcade and all the things yeah. 
You guys won some loot there, too. Yeah. You came home with a... It's Miko, and I come here with home with a axe throwing. Axe throwing. And Brucey, my sister, her name is Brucey, she come home with a big, big kind of... Big caterpillar. Yeah, that caterpillar was almost the size of the car. Yeah, she probably got a lot of money. We talked a little bit on the way home, a lot of it, because it was a, a pretty long drive for you guys. Four yes. hours is a pretty long drive. But and we talked about how important it is, especially after seeing Katie, mm-hmm. and knowing that you never know what what could happen. You, you know, don't know. you yeah. got to live life to the what. Carpedium sees the moment. Sees the moment. Like really make sure you enjoy every moment that you possibly can, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So with all of that said, overall, what would you rate Las Vegas? One to ten. I twenty. It would get a twenty. You know what was interesting? What? You said that was your favorite trip. Yeah. And to me, that that's a lot of seizing the moment because it made me realize you'd kind of forgotten about some of your other trips maybe because you were really just really enjoying Vegas in the moment, right? Yeah. Because you've been to Hawaii and uh-huh. all over. Disneyland. Oh, yeah, you've been to Disney World even. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but but as yeah. but, uh-huh. but as of current, Vegas yeah. is, that was the top yeah. spot. Because I've never been to Vegas in my mommy. I've been there like so many times. She can count on her fingers. Yeah, no, I can't. I don't have enough fingers to count on <laughs> as far as how many times I've been. Anyway, all uh, right. Well, I'm glad you had a good time in Vegas. Thank you. And oh, can I tell you about Richie Butney? Oh, oh, that could be. Oh, sure. Um, so that way, it, before we gotta go, that way, it, me and my mommy and Lucy, we was. The way it, um, a practice trip. Go. Oh yeah, we called that our. Pa- that's our practice trip to Vegas because. Again, the way it unexpected. It trip. was unexpected. Yeah, and we also, didn't, we didn't know. No one knows. And also, so Bootsy going to be twenty one. Her twenty first uh-huh. birthday. She's decided she wants to go to Vegas. Bootsy choose Las Vegas. Yes, yeah, so we called that our practice trip. We were just practicing uh-huh. for the big 21st birthday. So the next epic show is going to be lit. Lit? Okay. <laughs> you know what would also be lit? <laughs> you know what would also be lit, Sandler? If you could like, subscribe. Like, follow, subscribe. Like, follow, subscribe. And, and like again. Like again. And more Follow like, more and subscribe. Fun. Get all your friends to subscribe uh-huh. to Adult Chicken. Uh-huh. And you can, you can find Adult Chicken on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Apple Podcast. YouTube. YouTube. Apple and Spotify Apple Podcasts. And all of them. And at AdultChicken.com. And AdultChicken.com. And my mom. Um, Instagram. Instagram. Adult Adult. underscore chicken. Uh-huh. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. You too. See you next week. And and don't have a good day. Have a dope day. Love you, Mommy. Love you, Sandler.